is my great pleasure to invite uh, uh, Yala Brinkman to come here. No, uh, Yala, let's see if I get this right. He made this PhD in Cambridge with Richard um, Ellis uh, and collected the topic related somehow related to the topic today. Then he moved to Oxford as a feedback fellow, independent fellow. I worked with other people uh, from there, namely Joe Silk. And if I am correctly, then he went to Gushing in uh, Germany, where he has gone to the group, let's say, of astronomy and astrophysics. From there, he get, I think, a three years position at the uh, at Porto for a short period. Then he got his first job at Leiden University as a lecturer and associate professor. Then he was well, invited to return to Kaup. Uh, the same center is today to become the director, he's still the director there. And uh, that's his introduction. Thank you very much. And this is uh, the topic that uh, we already talked about. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lidio. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it's great to come here and be welcome with uh, port wine and everything. So I have to take that. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, a survey I'm leading called New Spain. Um, which is a survey basically where we study the most boring galaxies you could possibly imagine. And I'll, I'll show you, demonstrate you how boring they are in a little bit. And we do this in order to study, want to study dark matter. So like most of these things, when you start getting gray hairs, usually the work that's I presented is completely done by your students, or at least to a large extent. So, so this is work done with my PhD student, Daniel Vaz in, in Porto. Bas Dautendijk was my PhD student in Leiden, and Mariana Julio was my master's student in, in, uh, in Porto, um, but also with a number of other students, and also a PhD student, Maria Jacinto, who unfortunately passed away unexpectedly in May, yeah, who also worked on this project. So let me start. So one of the reasons we're doing this is we want to study place constraints on dark matter. Okay? So here is one way of this what dark matter is it's showing you so here the, the challenge is, is is a joke of course this one it, the challenge is to figure out which of these names correspond to real dark matter candidates that people have actually proposed and which ones are silly things and sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not but the most important part here is actually the orders of magnitude. This is a more serious version. So here you can see these are dark matter pan candidates being proposed. So they span 80 orders of magnitude in mass, right? So, so when you ask me what's dark matter, we do not really have a clue, right? And so as an observational astronomer, what I'm interested in is to rule out part of this parameter space. And, and what you really do is this, right? So the fingers here are the theorists that come up with new ideas <laughs> and the observational astronomer, basically their job is to try to rule out part of parameter space. I would say at the moment, we're not in a stage from an astronomical point of view to, to determine what is a dark matter candidate, which is saying these ones can't be. So that's what I'm going to end up with after a bit of introduction. Um, so why we, so the, the way that we're attacking this is we're going to attack it because we have a model for um, the large scale structure of the universe. And it's spectacularly successful. Um, it's called the Lambda CDM model. It's a bit choppy because of the internet, but it will survive. Um, and, and it's very, very good at large scales, but it has problems on small scales. So, and, and that gives us a handle on dark matter. So let me show you that in a non-movie version. Uh, so here I'm showing you, um, it's called the power spectrum. This is shown in cosmologists' favorite units so that big numbers on the x-axis corresponds to small scales and small numbers correspond to big scales. Um, and on the y-axis, I show the power spectrum, which basically tells you how clumpy the universe is at that scale. And so on large scales, we know that dark matter is a good representation. And this tells us also that it has to be cold relative to this scale, which basically means it can't have traveled significant part of this scale since the Big Bang, right? That's sort of the rough, rough idea. 
But on small scales, we don't have that constraint, and different models for dark matter will give you different predictions. So on small scales, there are various ways we can we can dig into the nature of dark matter. But we know that on large scales, it must approximately be a cold dark matter particle. And so this cold dark matter model is attractive in some ways because it makes some predictions. It makes these various of these predictions that are going here. There's a nice review by Bolok and Bolok Kolchin, uh, which you can look at if you want to get more details. I'm not going to go into all of these um, predictions because they are not interesting for what I'm talking about. What I am going to talk about towards the end is that one prediction is that dark matter, dark matter halos, which is where galaxies live, all have the same density profile or these come from the same density profile family, right? And we want to test that. Now, the problem is that these predictions, they are for a universe that does not exist, right? So at some level, they're totally irrelevant. And when I say it corresponds to a universe that doesn't exist, it's because all of these predictions are for universes that are only consist of dark matter, right? The real universe, as we are living proof of, consists of baryons as well. And those baryons cause problems. Um, so when we are looking at galaxies, we can look at their density profile. We can measure density profiles of more massive galaxies. And here is an example of this. This is the radius plotted here. Um, and this is the density. And as you can see, it rises up and it flattens off. If you compare that now with what a dark matter model predicts, which is these lines here, you can see that's a dramatically different prediction. And so the, the immediate thing you would say is, that, okay, these are inconsistent. So do, do these observations then rule out dark matter? No, I don't, not at all, because that's not, these, these galaxies are not made up of dark matter only. They consist also of variables. But it, but it highlights a, a, a possible problem. I don't think it's a problem, um, but it also highlights a potential. So because there are ways of solving these core profiles, we can modify dark matter. We make it slightly warm so that it moves a little bit. That washes out the central cusp in the dark matter density distribution. We can make dark matter interact with itself that releases energy. That energy can be used to redistribute the central density. Or we can have other types of dark matter that might also modify this density profile. But even just having feedback from exploding stars is enough to change the central density profile. And so here is a set of simulations. Um, these symbols that you show here are measures of the slope of the density profile in the center. So when it's a logarithmic measure, so zero corresponds to completely flat, but the density profile goes completely flat. Minus 1.5 means that the density profile goes up sharply as expected from cold dark matter. What the simulations are find plotting here, they're plotted as a function of stellar mass to halo mass. That basically is how many baryons there are per dark matter particle. And so you can see on this side, there's a lot of baryons per dark matter particle. This side is not interesting, there's a lot of baryon physics that happens here, so you can ignore visually everything that's on this side. You can talk about it if you're interested, but it's not interesting for this talk. But here, we're in a situation where basically the feedback is of star formation in these galaxies is sufficient to change the central density profile. You inject enough energy from supernova feedback to actually redistribute the central densities and make the density profile flat. But as you go to galaxies with less and less baryons, there's less and less baryon physics possible to happen, right? So you come to these galaxies, there's no baryons there. Very, very few baryons. And in these galaxies, there's no way that, that baryon, those baryons can have any effect on the dark matter halo. And what you're actually gonna see is an echo of the true dark matter density distribution. At least that's what the simulations tell you. And that means that this is what we, these are the galaxies you want to study. Right? That's where we, in principle, if we can measure their density profile, what we're actually measuring is the density profile of dark matter. At least that's the whole. 
but those are dwarfs still? Those are dwarfs. Those are really, really small dwarfs. The smallest galaxy we currently been in the literature has a total stellar mass of 16 solar masses for the entire galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, so these are very, very small galaxies. And uh, the galaxies, uh, <coughs> these galaxies are also interesting to study because we have this relationship, which is between dark matter halo mass and stellar mass. And this, has, this is a relationship that's been studied. It's constrained. This cartoon here represents observational constraints. It depends on the galaxy property, what happens up here. Um, some galaxies will see you up. Um, but down here, we have no idea what happens. These are very low stellar masses. Their escape velocities are small. Su one supernova explosion, the energy that you release in a supernova explosion is enough to basically eject the, the stellar content out of these halos. So what happens in these very small halos, we don't know, and it's very interesting. So we would like to understand that better, but we have no constraints uh, yet on that. Right, okay, so this all suggests that you should study these ultra faint dwarfs, uh, which is what I'm gonna talk about in the rest of the time. And that is really because these are so dark matter dominated, as I say, that you can actually use stars in them as test particles of the dark matter potential. So here, just to illustrate that, here is a plot of the absolute value magnitude of the galaxies. So a typical galaxy like the Milky Way is over here. Uh, these are very, very faint galaxies. And on the y-axis, we plot um, the dark matter mass divided by the baryon mass. So you can see in these systems here, there's thousand times as much dark matter as there is luminous matter. These are the most dark matter dominated objects we know in the universe. So that's why these are the ones you want to study. Of course, the downside of these things being so faint, you have almost no stars. That's, um, so that is a challenge. So we started out the survey. Um, these red dots show you which galaxies we're actually targeting. Um, as a comparison, these stars here are global clusters in the Milky Way. And so some of these galaxies are fainter than the global, the faint global clusters. Um, so they are quite an interesting thing. Incidentally, it also tells you, you know, at some level, you start asking if, if you have a galaxy that has a total mass in stars of 16 solar masses, what does that make that a galaxy and not a star cluster? Right? 16 solar masses, that's like 20 stars. Um, and so the definition we're using, the way we're thinking about this is that the galaxy is a system, a relaxed gra gravitating system of stars in a dark matter halo. So dark matter halo is a necessity to make a galaxy. If it doesn't have a dark matter halo, we call it a star cluster. So that's the definition. Take it as you will. Um, to study this, we, we, you, we I have a, a survey called Muse Fame. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the immediate question is, how do you know that there is dark matter in one phase and there is no dark matter in another phase? So, this yeah. So based based on this plot here, I don't know, right? So when I target this, I don't know if these are galaxies or star clusters, particularly down here. Uh, I don't know. I have to go and observe them to measure the velocities of the stars. So I I missed my segue into this slide. <laughs> so. So then this is exactly how we measure these, these velocities. So um, news is an integral field spectrograph. So I can go and I can take a spectrum of every pixel in the sky. And so when I have a lot of stars, this is very convenient because I can get a spectrum of that star, that star, that star, that star, that star, and I can measure their velocities. The alternative is use a fiber spectrograph. And those are quite clumpy. They might, might not be able to put their fibers closer than an arc minute from the sky. Um, and many of these stars are separated by arc seconds. So with news, we're able to do really, really well within one arc minute, right? So we can do really well where it's a dense and we do really badly when there's very sparse set of stars. And I'll show you an, an example of that in, in a little bit. And so I'll, I'll show you exactly how we do this, this process in a second. Um, the main justification for doing this survey was firstly to try to understand whether these systems have 
dark matter have cores in their density distribution because that immediately will tell us something about dark, the nature of dark matter. Um, well, I wish there was, but it seem to be. Um, and we also are very quite affected by <coughs> motions of binary stars. So that's another thing we, we try to look at where we don't have much results at the moment. Um, so here is why these are very boring. Um, so they're very, very boring galaxies to show in a popular talk. So the, the boxes are there to guide the eye for you to see where the galaxies are. And um, as you see, they are not very visible. Right? It's, uh, you would have to go really, really close. Maybe you can see a slight over density of stars here. That's about it. These systems, and this is the challenge, the contrast between the stars that belong to these dwarfs and the stars that belong to the Milky Way is not very high. So that's another reason why we need to get spectra of every one to figure out whether this star belongs to this dwarf or whether it's something that's in the Milky Way or somewhere in between. But they are not, uh, so when I show this in the public talks, they are, nobody is very impressed, um, surprisingly. So here is an example of our you know, the power of news relative to others, or the power of hyperspectral as relative to news. This is a dwarf called Sculptor. It's not an ultra faint dwarf, it's a bigger dwarf. The red points are all the spectra taken with a, a fiber spectra, a classical spectra from Walker et al. And in blue are those that we got from Muse. And so here is a little animation just to give you an idea. Bang. So that's what Muse gets you a tiny, tiny little bit of the galaxy. But it gets you a heck of a lot of spectra in that little bit. So here there is one red point, another red point, and another red point. So there are three spectra from this massive survey, and we have 400. Right? So there is a balance, depends on the science question, what you want to do. We got these ones to try to understand what's the dynamical center is of this dwarf, something that still isn't known. And so we're hoping that we pointed close to the center. <laughs> so if it is, then we have a lot of stars in the Eric center. If the center is over here, then we have echo dark days. But we'll see. We haven't analyzed that yet. Okay. All right. So let me illustrate it with another galaxy called Leo T. It's another dwarf, another one you can't really see. Um, it is an interesting object. It's something, a paper that Daniel Vaz put out this summer. Um, what we do is we get news data, and we get images from Hubble Space Telescope, and then we get whatever exists in the literature, and then we combine this, because what we do is we take the HST data as priors. They tell us what, with very high accuracy where the stars are, and then we have a code that optimally extracts out. So with news, you get a data cube. So Two dimensions is the spatial positions, and one dimension is the wavelength. We know where the stars are, and so we can now optimally extract out the spectra of each individual star, even closer than the, than the spatial resolution of the data. And so all these green circles here are stars. This is the HST image in the background. All these ground green circles show you stars for which we got spectra and measured velocities and metallicities for this using these various codes that are mentioned up there. So we do this. Um, then we analyze the properties of these stars. We use a color magnitude diagram, which is the observational astronomer's version of the Hertz from Russell diagram. And we can, in this case, most of these systems are very, very old. Okay? Most of these systems started forming stars at the time of realization. Realization went through, added basically uh, basically ionize all the hydrogen atoms around. And for most of these dwarfs, they, their dark matter potential is so shallow that just to tend to the four Kelvin that reionization essentially heated the system up by is enough to eject the gas from their system. Leo T is just on the border, so it has retained a bit of gas and managed to form stars later. So it has a few young stars whose nature was not fully understood. Um, but we uh, were able to sort of split it into older and, and younger stars. And um, so your ionization yeah. was responsible, responsible for the well, also galaxy gas. have so much, so very few stars. That's 
the theoretical expectation is that you, you start out pre-realization, each dark matter halo would be basically filled with neutral hydrogen. Um, they will start forming stars at a low level, but most of it will be neutral. And then during the period of realization, all basically you add, you know, basically 13 electron volts per hydrogen atom and sufficient to ionize all the hydrogen atoms. And that overall tends to give you a, a, a heating of the gas to, to a very low temperature, about 10 to the 4 Kelvin equivalent. And that, that gives you then a, so then you can calculate what's the escape velocity of the halos. And for these ultra faint, sort of very small 10 to the 8 solar masses at the time halos, the escape velocity is so low that, that the 10 to the 4 Kelvin is sufficient to push the gas out. And so realization basically works as a little brush of removing the gas from all the low mass halos. And those that are on the border will later be able to re accrete, but for most it will be lost and ended up in bigger halos. So that's, that's the pretty picture. We don't, we have no observational proof that that's what happens, but that's what at least what the theoretical expectation is. So, um, so that's also why we're interested in that, but that's not something I'm going to talk about today. Uh, much at all, but it is a very interesting question whether we can actually see uh, the observational echoes of that. You know, so. Right. So let me let me say a little bit. So now I have velocities for these. I know which stars belong to the dwarf more or less. I know I can split it into old and young stars. Um, so now I have everything I need to to constrain dark matter properties. But let me have a little detour, just talking about what is inside this galaxy. So what's the baryonic content of this galaxy? Um, and, and for that, I think it's interesting to, to give you another sort of, you know, interesting little way of looking at these dwarfs. So now I'm going to look at a galaxy called Anthea B. It's another dwarf, one where you can actually probably see there is something here. Am I more or less convincing you that there is a galaxy here? <laughs> Maybe not, uh, but there is. Um, we can measure there, so this is the news equivalent, but we can measure the velocities of a large number here, about 300 or so stars. We can measure the velocity. They have a very nice tight uh, peak in velocity. We can measure their, their properties and it, it all works. So I can fit these stars. I can remove them. Right? I know their, their spatial profile. I can subtract them off. So what's left here are galaxies, a couple of galaxies, that's all. Um, and then I can go into this tube where I'm now taking away all the stars and I can look at interesting wavelengths. So I'm going to look at the hydrogen Balmer hydrogen alpha line to see if there is anything happening in this galaxy. And lo and behold, there is. So there is an emitting region here. Mm -hmm, that's kind of stretched. So this is very overexposed to this image. Another emitting region here. There's another one here, which is less convincing. These are all consistent with being supernova remnants. How many stars? The, the whole galaxy has 10 to the 5 solar masses in stars. Um, if with that mass, it's, and it hasn't had any recent star formation, so this can only be, should only be type 1 A supernova remnants. Um, Three of those for 10 to the 5 solar masses is about 500 times too many. So I don't really know. Well, it's just in prep because I don't know what to say here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the supernova rate based on this is, uh, is insanely high. I don't know why. And I can't write that in a paper, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, anyway, that's where I'm at. Um, it's puzzling. Um, another puzzling part of it is that it has gas. So this is the lowest mass galaxy that we know of that actually has atomic gas. Um, it has, so as 10 to the 5 says, so stellar content, the gas, the H1 gas, is of the same order of magnitude, again, 10 to the 4, but 10 to the 5. So this one has actually retained quite a lot of gas. And it comes in two phases, a warm one, which has a temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin, and a cold one. Um, about 800 Kelvin or so. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a puzzle. Why was it have these two phases? Um, it's not very clear. 
And we were also very curious whether this could be linked to the young stars that we see here. So this is not cold as in cold enough to form stars, obviously, you know, because those stars have a hundred Kelvin gas even, but, uh, but it's still quite cold. Um, and so the question is, is that linked to the recent star formation? And to do that, uh, we started out by doing um, stellar kinematics. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do this. This is a this one is a simple CNC analysis where we you can see the line of sight velocities for the stars, the numbers. You, we model this, taking into account the complex uncertainties on them, and we can split it into the young and old populations, and uh, we get different velocity dispersions in these two systems. And, um, and the interesting thing is when we then compare that to the gas, the velocity dispersion of the cold gas corresponds, which is plotted in, in blue here, corresponds very well to the velocity dispersion of the stars. Now, this plot is almost certainly a bit of a chance, right? With this kind of uncertainty, it could have been everywhere, anywhere. This triangle could be anywhere within this error bar, right? So it's just chance that it's so nicely overlapping. So don't take that <laughs> as a real proof. Um, and also the hot gas and the old stars also have very similar um, velocity dispersion. This does not prove that they are physically, that they are causally linked, but it's certainly consistent with the cold gas being linked to what caused the formation of the young stars. And these two are consistent with being hanging around in the stellar, in the gravitational potential uh, since the early formation time, which is probably at the order of 10, 12 giga years ago. Right. We could also measure metallicities for this, um, which is a, another puzzle about this galaxy is that regardless of the age of the stars, they have the same metallicity. And that's not what you would expect. You would expect things to stars will explode. They will put metals into the intimate stellar medium. The stars that form from that should then have a higher metal list than the ones that came before. So why they are over 13 giga years, they maintain the same metal list distribution. We don't understand. And, uh, but it, it's, uh, it is seen in some simulations. I don't think we really understand why it's seen there either, but, uh, but it's, uh, it is a little bit puzzling. Okay, so that's so that was a quick. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. metallicity is low or high or normal? It's it, it's normal, I would say, for these dwarfs. Okay, so the, uh, this is this metallicity is uh, well, about minus one point five, minus one point six in solar units, so about fortieth, fiftieth of solar. Um, it's it's sort of run of the mill for these dwarf galaxies. So it's a typical metal is heat. The slightly smaller ones, they get down to minus 2.5 or so, so 100 or so. Again, that's more or less what you expect if they form all their stars at redshifts of 10, 11, 12, etc. And all of them have the same metal is heat. They, they don't have exactly the same metal is no, yeah, okay. but, but it's a, it's, it's so so each one has quite consistent metal is heat. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is, but, but the distribution of the young and the old stars to be plotted as a function of age of the stars, it's, it's essentially constant. And, and people have seen that in photometric studies as well. So it's not just our spectroscopic study that shows this. So, so exactly how to do that, you have to properly, you have to sort of balance how much metals you let go out of the galaxy and how much you retain. That's the only way you can keep it. Um, so it's a bit weird. But uh, these systems are kind of weird. Right. So, so let me turn to dark matter because that's what I was going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to talk about three different ways of constraining dark matter with these dwarfs. Um, we'll look at how to constrain what's classically called massive uh, compact halo objects. In practice, it, people, everybody thinks about primordial black holes when they say that. Um, so I'm going to swap a little bit between calling them that and macho. Um, so trying to constrain the population of those. Um, we're going to look at uh, constraints on axial light particles. These are very light dark matter particles. So we're going to see if we can constrain their emission. And I'm going to look at 
um, dark matter models using the motions of stars, which is what I talked about earlier, which is a dynamical measure. So there's like three different ways we can use the same data to try to tackle three different questions. So let me start with the first one. Um, so this is a galaxy called Eridanus 2. It was discovered independently by two groups in 2015. And when they discovered it, so the, it, it's difficult to see here. The, the galaxy basically goes like this. Okay? It's very challenging to see even on the screen. Um, but when they discovered that, they found there was a little overdensity, and that you probably can't see, and a slight overdensity here. And they proposed that this might be a cluster of stars. And that got people excited. So why did people get excited by this little fuzzy blob there? So imagine that your entire galaxy, the dark matter is all composed of mass shows or primordial black holes. So you have a soup of black holes, and then you have this little cluster of stars that's now going to travel through that soup of dark matter of uh, black holes. And what happens is that if those black holes have masses above the mass of the stars in the cluster, you're going to transfer energy, typically, at least with the normal assumptions, you will transfer energy from the dark the, the black holes to the stars in the cluster. And so what happens then is, of course, you're going to puff up the cluster. Right? And so the fact that the cluster is still visible means that it can't have puffed up completely. Right? And so that's the idea. Um, this is worked out in a paper by Brandt in 2016. Um, but the problem with this was that you didn't know whether this was a cluster. It was just, a, you know, some blobs on the on the on the screen. So the first thing we had to do was to measure the velocity of the stars in the cluster. And that's what we show here. So this is cluster centric radius. So the blue here is the stuff that's within that supposed cluster. And the yellow is what's outside. So what, what we want to well, Sutton, like the student was doing, he said, okay, I'm just going to define the clusters are within that circle, and I'm just going to measure everything inside. And so everything in blue you measure, and you can see there is a set of five stars that have very, very similar stellar, uh, stellar velocity, and there's a couple that are outlined. So what I think, reality, this is the cluster, and these two stars belong to the rest of the galaxy. And the rest of the galaxy, you see there is a spreading velocity between the stars. Uh, but we didn't we didn't make that a posteriori justification. We included everything in our analysis of the cluster. But it's certainly the velocity dispersion inferred is much smaller than it is for the rest of the galaxy. So we concluded that this was actually a cluster. And so then it is a cluster. Then we can use a simple uh, diffusion uh, problem approach. We're basically looking at the two body interactions. This is classical Binney and Tremaine. Um, equations are essentially just lifted straight from Binion Trebek with slight modifications. Um, and you basically get an expression for your literal theorem where you can calculate the radius of the cluster. Right. And so now the criteria we're saying that, okay, if the, the cluster doubles in size during its lifetime, we can measure its lifetime from the age of the stars. And we said then we rule out this, this part of around this place. There's too many black holes in that case. For this to be feasible. And so when we do that, um, you know, there are many small assumptions in here, but what I'm plotting here is a logarithmic x-axis. Most of these assumptions make shifts the line by a tiny amount. And so it then rules out all of this parameter space above the lines, so like one sigma and two sigma. So it says that this is a fraction of dark matter made up of primordial black holes. And it basically tells you in this case. You know, forget primordial black holes with a mass of thousand solar masses because those are, they can't definitely can't make up dark matter. Hundred solar masses pretty much ruled out. Ten solar masses, who knows? A bit hard to say. One solar mass, based on our observation, perfectly fine, no problem. But people have also looked at this with microlensing. If you put microlensing constraints on, they rule out the low mass end. So this is now the joint constraint on how much of dark matter can be made up of primordial black holes. And you can see there is still a little bit of space for the sort of solar stellar mass-ish black holes, um, but, uh, but it's not, not a, lot of, a lot of space for it. So, so the takeaway from our side is that these matches are unlikely to make up a significant part of dark matter. This was also what 
found his first study where he didn't know whether it was a cluster or not. Um, so I think this is relatively robust. Um, and uh, we sort of haven't got any more clusters in these galaxies, so we can't do this again in this way at least, but, uh, but it's at least improving. So, so let me move to axions. Um, this is another dark matter particle. So axions were, they're named after this thing in progress, literally. And they were named that because they were, they were invented as a way to resolve, to clean up a problem in quantum chromodynamics. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that at all because we're actually not constraining that type of axion at all. Um, but uh, these are very, very low mass dark matter candidates. But what I'm talking about now today is actually not ultra low. Um, oh, that was actually what I was saying. Um, right. So these are, just, these are typically, they're very low mass. So they're typically not produced in a thermal way. Um, what's interesting for dark matter, they have to be typically be non-thermally produced, the various ways they can be produced. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I refer you to need you who knows much more about this than me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, but there's, again, there's a very large parameter space, right? So, so what, we're, what we were doing, we we're looking at a very esoteric part of it. We're looking at the coupling between these axions and the electromagnetic field. So that is, if that is, non-zero, then you will have decay of these axion-like particles into photons. And so the idea is that you know the mass of the axions, you can then predict what the wavelength of that light is. And that's the equation is given there. And so, and that then basically, if the axions all had about the same mass, they should all give rise to a nice little emission line with a particular wavelength. So that's what you want to look for. And so then you can imagine now that you, you're looking at the sky with a spectrograph and you go like this and then suddenly you come over some area where there's a lot of dark matter, boy, there should be a spike in emission corresponding to that wavelength. And then you move off and then suddenly that spike goes away. So that's what we want to look for. There's many other ways of, of, of looking at that, you know, solar physics, stellar evolution, etc. So this is just one narrow way of doing it. This is the um, bottom. This is the, I'm not sure it's a state of the art today, it's a state of the art in 2018, and I haven't actually checked whether it has changed significantly. Um, uh, but here is the strength of sort of the interaction strength with, with the, the electromagnetic radiation. Here is the mass of the axions. And again, you can see this one is a relatively minor 20 orders of magnitude. Uh, and all of these colored bits of bits, all every, except the yellow. Because the yellow is not an observational constraint. This is where physicists want to be, because this is a QCD axiom. Okay, so this is interesting. If you can get down to this yellow line, that's interesting for physicists. That's not what we do. Let's stop. You need to hammer things out. So, what we were looking at was this wavelength, this mass range. That's what we can do with the current technique. Um, right. So, I think I can get quickly through this. It's a bit too didactic. Um, so the idea is that if you look to integrate through a dark matter dominated system, you have a certain conversion rate between axions and photons given by this expression. Um, you have to know the density distribution of the system, which is something that we can, which I'll talk about next, which you can infer from our dynamics. And then you can observe, hope to observe an emission line at the end. And that's the actual prediction is the equation on the mean. So this is all pretty straightforward and simple. Um, we again we went to Leo T. And what's cute about this is that you throw away all the sources. Right? You're interested in looking in between everything. So you, we've spent a lot of energy to try to look at all these stars, but for doing this project, we need to throw away everything, right? We need to mask all the sources and then sum up. And the result here, this is a couple of papers from my um, by Regis et al. and another one by Fabrel et al. I'm not sure whether it's accepted yet. Um, the uh, no, let me actually move to this one. So this is the um, is the constraint that we get on the this interaction strain as a function of mass. And, uh, and this was the previous record in terms of constraint. 
Um, and we've sort of improved on these previous constraints with this one by quite a bit, which was satisfying. But it's very chastening when you then put it on this side now. Right? <laughs> then you want to see how did, how much did this matter in the whole picture? And uh, mm -hmm. well, a bit, but <laughs> not the whole lot, right? So, but this is what, what we ruled out now um, with this observation. And that's satisfying to put that on the on the diagram, of course, but uh, there is a lot of white left to rule out here. Sorry, yeah, to yeah. So the loud region is the white. Is the white, yeah, plus the yellow, which is plus just the, the yellow. Yeah. yeah. The white area is still all around. So there's some parts that are really tempting to get down to here. This is very interesting region to, to push into. Because from QCD's point of view, this is a very natural mechanism that will be very attractive for quantum chromodynamics. Um, so it, finding it would be would be a great breakthrough. Whether it's there or not, you know, you never know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, right. Okay, so that's axioms. So let me move to the final part. So this is now trying to use dynamics to determine, to, to place constraints in dark matter models. And so what we do here is we've done all the measurements. As I said, we've measured the velocities of stars. We know where they are spatially. Now we use, we basically use a genes equation solver. We've just solved the genes equation for these stars. Or for all of them. We better we use two different codes for this, which use different assumptions because you know these are these are part of you know push we're pushing everything to watch what one can do. So using two different codes is kind of sensible here to cross-check results. Um, and um, so we, we we input a density distribution. I'll tell you in a second which ones we use. We input this density distribution in this. We use these codes to then predict what is the velocity dispersion at various spatial locations in the galaxy. And then we compare that prediction to what we actually measure in terms of velocity dispersion. It's the best we can do right now. Sorry. Yeah. You probably choose some of the lines, specific lines, according to what you want. To, I mean, what no, in this case, we, 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 we do, we, we measure the velocities of the stars using a, a full spectrum fit, a cross correlation of the whole spectrum. And so we know the velocity of each star. And then we put, you put in a density distribution into one of these codes, and that will predict for you the velocity dispersion at every location, spatial location of the galaxy. And then I go to the observations and I see what the observations are telling me is the velocity dispersion in that position. And then I compare the predicted velocity dispersion with the observed. So okay, that's so we'll in this case, now you are ready, you come back to the stars. Come back to the stars only. Okay. Only use the stars because there isn't enough gas in the system yeah. to do anything else. Well, there is gas, but we don't have any spatial resolution. So I don't know whether the gas is centrally concentrated or wide. So then I can't use it for dynamical modeling. But I only know an overall velocity dispersion. That's never going to tell me what the full time looks like. Because I need to really spatially resolve it to, to say, you know, which way does it go? Does it go up? Does it go down? So there the is not enough emission lines. No, there's no emission you lines. Cannot, you cannot see emission lines to map, to map the velocities in those galaxies. No. Unfortunately, that would be nice, but not on the moon. Even, even Antlia B, which is the only one that shows emission, I can't do it. The only time when there is there is emission of appearing at times, but it's actually just a veil from the Milky Way that's in front of us or behind the galaxy. Occasionally I see those, but it's not related to the dwarf. The dwarfs themselves do not have emission lines at all. Which is a pity. I mean there's a there's a few stars with emission lines, but they're not you know not, they're not gas. No, no gas. There's H1 gas, but we don't have the spatial resolution to use that. Okay, and then so then we assign like using MCMC. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you also what models we use. So one thing we use is we use cold dark matter. It has a very, it, everybody agrees it has this sort of density distribution or another one closely related. There's an inastal distribution that's slightly better fit, but it has one extra parameter. So we use the simplest one. Um, uh, we also have a model for self-interacting dark matter. Just rephrasing ourselves from, from Lin and Lo, um, some simple model. But basically, the, the, the idea here is that the dark matter particle has this interaction between themselves, even though they don't interact with the rest of the universe. 
And by doing that, you can, you can basically flatten out the central density where the density is very high. You have an interaction that goes to density squared. So where the density is high, you have higher interactions uh, and hence the change in density is larger. When you do that model, you get a density distribution like this, where you need to you know the age of the stellar population. And then you want to infer something like a, a cross section. So the what is, what is yeah. RS? R is a, it's a scale radius. It's a fitting, it's a parameter of the model. It's the scale radius of the halo. Um, it's typically of the order of the half of the mass or so, but not quite. Yeah. So sometimes we parameterize it with half mass radius instead, which is probably physically a bit clearer. So I, I'm using, we, we have them in various varieties because it depends on convergence, what works best, but it gives sort of size. And and RC, well, thanks for asking. I was going to say RC is the size of the core that you get. So the bit where the density distribution is kind of flat in the center. And uh, finally, we have one last weirdo, which is what's dark matter. This is dark matter where the mass is so low that the De Broglie wavelength is astronomical. Okay, so these are particles where the wavelength of the particle is tens of parsec. Right. So that's pretty weird. Um, these things form a bose, they, they're also bosons, I forgot to say. So they form bose Einstein condensate, but that bose Einstein condensate is now the size of our dwarfs. So, you know, tens of parsecs, 20 parsecs or so. Media works on this too, but his condensates tend to be, you know, more like star size. Yeah. So, in our case, these are galaxy size. It's all very weird. I never understood how this really works because I don't, I'm not sure that all the assumptions that go into the calculations are satisfied um, on galactic scale. But anyway, um, the density distribution is basically split into two here. There's a core part, and there's a, on the outside, it's basically cold dark matter. So it's cold dark matter, and then it has a weird hat on the top. So it's called a solar cold. So you can see it has an A power. A radius, so this one actually has quite a sharp edge and, and weird shape. So again, we here we want to uh, infer the mass of the particle, which is related to a bunch of other constants in here. Um, and so when we first did this, we did this squared on this too. Uh, we ran this code, the inferred density distribution is plotted in the various colors. The red one turns flattens here. This is all interacting dark matter. Um, that is in part caused by the parameter boundaries. So this is not a real flattening. This is the worst fit. These two, the blue and the green, are essentially indistinguishable. And what we find is that the core size of these systems, if you have a core, it has to be smaller than 35 parsec. Because that is, you can see where the stars are. That's shown as black spots here. We run out of stars towards the center. And so basically we can say that there is no big core. And in these classical dwarfs, this, these cores had to be hundreds of parsec in size or a kiloparsec in size. And we can rule out a kiloparsec size core, it would have looked like this here, right? It would have been completely flat. And so we can rule those out completely. And since dark matter has to be the same everywhere, that would be the only sensible way that the theory could work. If we can rule them out here, then they can't possibly explain the cores in the more massive galaxies. Um, we have run it for multiple galaxies. We are unable to rule out any of the models because all of these models can have tiny, tiny cores. And that we can't rule out. We can't rule out that there's a core of 10 parsecs because we don't have any stars. Uh, but we can place constraints on the fuzzy dark matter particle mass. And, um, and that's what we're showing here for various uh, analysis. This is what you would get if you think that the cores in the classical dwarfs is caused by dark matter. Then you get an upper limit of the mass. You can see some analysis like this. All the others are showing lower limits because they say, well, these are, there's really no way. And I'm pretty confident that our result is the most robust that's on this plot because the assumptions that go in are the simplest. This is only stellar dynamics. Um, it's relatively simplistic uh, in terms of assumptions. So we still have more dwarfs to include. and. Uh, we should be able to improve these constraints by another factor of two or so, uh, which makes us quite competitive. So uh, fuzzy dark matter, not ruled out, but it's not very strongly supported by our data.
We even looked at fuzzy dark matter with self-interaction in that whole case is called scale of field dark matter. So that's a mixture of self-interacting dark matter and fuzzy dark matter. Um, I'm just I'm showing it here. This is work by um, Mariana Julio. And here is an example of what we're doing. So this is the velocity pro uh, distribution profile in this galaxy, function of radius. And here are the measurements and our best fit model is this blue curve here and if we wanted to sort of say okay this is going to be something that also explains classical dwarfs we would have to have something like this red curve here which is strongly ruled out by the data so what does that where does that leave us um oh sorry i that was like a little bit behind okay let me let me just finish off before i summarize it as i was about to do with that solution, you can now have a density profile. You can integrate it up and get the mass of the halo. Right? And we can go back to this diagram where you can measure the virial mass versus the stellar mass. The stellar mass we can get from HST images. We can add up the stars. This we can now get from our fits. And we can try to figure out where our data falls in this diagram. And this is what we're getting. And that's where we are. This is where we are, pretty much. These are the two different genes code solvers, and they give different results, right? So I'm very happy that we decided to go with two completely different codes, because now we're seeing that they don't agree. It would have been really disastrous if I'd done one of these, and made some controversial claim, and then realized, well, if I run it with another code, it would get a completely different result. We don't know the reason for this. We think it's partially because we don't have stars at very large radii. These two codes use different priors on their on their profiles, on the assumptions of the profiles. Um, in re regardless of which one is right, this is still surprising. On this side, the, the halos are very small and have a lot of stars in them, which is surprising. On this side, we're extrapolating reasonably well from the higher mass galaxies, but then we have systems like Hydra 2, which appear to be vastly under in stars for its halo mass. We don't understand that either, how that could happen. It's relatively easy to, put, to, to explain this. It's very hard to explain this. So, no. Okay. Yeah. We look at for part B. Okay. On both plots. Yeah. Uh, are you so unhappy with the result? Do you think that they really visibly very different? They, at the moment, I would say I don't have enough data to say that they disagree. But this, the shift, the if I calculate the average location here and the average location here, that's more than this one sigma for sure. Now, for each individual point, no, they are not very much. It's just the it's just the taking them all together that that leads you to con conclude that there is a systematic, significant systematic offset. But each individual point is consistent within the arrow. So- Could it be that there is no reason or you cannot average at this moment because there is not enough data it's to possible. average? It's possible. Because so some of the them may be well observed or whatever, and others have systematic something. It is, they are all being analyzed in the same way. So I hope the systematic is the same for all of them, which is sort of consistent with the fact they're all shifting by set approximately the same amount. But but it's at the moment there is no other thing I can say about it. It's clearly not. I, I was thinking about systematic in, in the physical properties ah, of the galaxy. It might like be. In some cases, yeah. this analysis correct. Yeah. And in other cases, it's missing some information. Indeed. I think that is very likely to be the explanation that the stochasticity in the system is too, there's too much randomness in this plot to necessarily conclude anything at the moment. But so that's why we really want to do this better with more data. Uh, that's, uh, but at the moment, I think we're probably hitting what, what you're saying. We're a bit, we're they're probably too complex a system to, to be able to conclude anything on the basis of five objects. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to finish. I'm already over my time, and I, I think I just wanted to say there's a, there's a, several projects that were coming up where we're wanting to do this. This is a wide field service spectroscopic telescope. We're trying to make the next project for ESO to do uh, after ELT. 
Uh, we have another blue version of news, which should be very good for doing these kind of studies. And we also want to find many more of these works. And the Euclid Space Telescope, which we launched in, in July, is going to be fantastic for finding these works. And um, so there's going to be bigger samples and more data on this in some years. But for the moment, that's what we have. And I'm going to just going to leave you here with the conclusions because I talked for more than enough. And thanks, everybody, for your attention. So I have questions. Okay. Um, Please. Well, I think the need of problem. Uh, how 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 far away you can put this kind of model in the system of remote astronomers that if you look at them, uh, what you expect to go on on these Ashton and Island, this kind of thing. How how far you can go and put on this kind of thing? So, so uh, okay, so that's a that's a complex question to really answer. Um okay. so the what you can do with Euclid is you really you can find more of these works and you can do more of the dynamical studies. And that is constraining about here on the x axis. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. So it's sort of 10 to the minus 20 or so. Like okay. Okay. Uh, so we're not in this regime. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. So that's very boring for people that want to get the QCD. I think. Okay. But, um, okay. but on the other hand, it's interesting from other reasons. Okay. Uh, you didn't really make a comment that depends on the physics. I uh, I can use uh, let's say dark matter to explain because what are the other let's say standard explanations you have? I mean, uh, you can man you can manage to explain with just baryonic matter and stellar stellar evolution of stars and so on, or or you need really dark matter. So um. Or that matter any kind of you know exotic solution to the problem. Can you go and modify the millennium simulation in such a way that it can compensate or just in, in standard physics? So, so if, if you see so in any system where the where the amount of baryons is sort of of the order of 10 to 20 10th to 20th of, of the dark matter content, uh, you can explain it with the baryon physics. Okay. That's there's enough energy in the supernovas okay. to have happened throughout the life. Okay. For systems that are significantly lower in baryon content than that, they will if you if you then see a core, mm -hmm. uh, you will almost well, you're unlikely to be led towards a um, the dark matter explanation. But but here comes a little bit what Anna was also pointing out about variety because it also will depend on the history of these works okay. because if they have had the okay. gravitational interactions. Again, you can also flatten out the density distribution, but you wouldn't do that for a population. So for individual galaxies, you could see that, but not if you have a population and they all show force, then, then you will be forced towards the dark matter explanation. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, wait, wait. Can I ask a question? Okay. Uh, when you were talking about the small masses, the galaxies with the small masses, and you said that uh, they can. That we distinguish clusters from galaxies because of the dark matter halo. Uh, what do we, do we know, or do you have any theory for why these ones get this halo but the other ones don't? It, it, it probably goes the other way around. So most of the dark matter halos will form. Um, so you have first you have the decoupling of matter and radiation. At that point, the dark matter starts clumping. Um, and then for a while, you know, photons and baryons will continue to be uh, linked. So then the, the baryons will eventually start falling into the dark matter halo. So to some extent, it's the dark matter halos that act as the attractors for the baryons. I mean, you would expect naively to start with that you would have about the, bar the, the universal baryon fraction in each halo. And so the question is, well, then what happens after that? And so what, what the general picture is, and we don't really know if this is true, is that you will have supernovae, the stars forming, they go supernovae, they will blow out gas. Um, and that will be have more of an impact on the lowest mass systems. And that's why you see those lowest mass systems tending to have less and less gas content, less and less baryon content, because they just lost all the gas, so they couldn't form enough stars. And that's why we think those systems have very, very few stars. And then came in the, uh, the the epoch of reionization, and then washed out everything else. And so that's that's the main reason we think happens. So so there's going to be there could be dark matter halos out there that has one star. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
We're never going to find that, but the principle is to be there. Okay. Sorry, we don't have time for more questions. As thanks for speaker again. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe.